In Hopkinton, a town that seemed too perfect to hide darkness, the Entwistle family was harboring a horrifying secret, ready to haunt your worst nightmares. Hopkinton, a serene town with 16,000 residents in the eastern United States, is a short 40-minute drive from Boston, Massachusetts. Unlike the city, it was a residential haven characterized by expansive housing developments, and in one such charming residence lived the delightful Entwistle family, 27-year-old Neil, his wife Rachel, and their nine-month-old daughter Lillian. Neil and Rachel met in 1999 at the University of York in England. Rachel, an animated American studying literature as part of a student exchange, crossed paths with Neil, who was pursuing a reserved course in electronic engineering for his master's degree. Nevertheless, the saying opposites attract was never more describing than for these two, because their differences did not prevent them from falling in love as they spent a lot of time together rowing on the university team. And the couple seemed strong as they resisted the year of long distance imposed by Rachel's return to the United States after the end of the exchange program she participated in. The unwavering love that united them eventually brought her back to her boyfriend in England, to Worcester. After obtaining her diploma, it then led them both to the hotel, where they got married on August 23, 2003. Happy moments of their life as young spouses were regularly captured and shared on a website that Neil created specifically for this purpose, where he also multiplied passionate declarations towards his wife. The birth of their adorable daughter, Lillian Rose, on April 9, 2005, forever sealed this family union. Neil flourished in fatherhood, and he was very involved with his baby as well as with Rachel, whom he considered his soulmate. The whole family moved to the United States in pursuit of the American dream, a choice that delighted his wife who was happy to soon reunite with her loved ones and the route she left behind for love. The young parents and their daughter enjoyed the change of atmosphere offered by this new country they had just moved to. They were happy to have made the decision to leave England, and their fulfillment seemed to reach another level. It was the right choice. However, Neil, who was an expert in computer science and development, certainly had preconceived ideas about American recruitment and the possibility of securing a good position in a reputable company. He encountered a reality that wasn't what he had hoped for. After several months of unsuccessful job searching, it became clear that the American job market wasn't as open as he believed, especially when it came to high-level positions with substantial compensation. This unexpected status quo couldn't persist, given that the financial situation of the couple wasn't improving quite the opposite. So, out of necessity, Neil turned to selling computer products on eBay. Engaging in computer product buy and sell diverged from his university career and proved disastrous for Neil due to poor management, resulting in unfulfilled orders, customer complaints, and business closure. Neil's failure led to personal humiliation, concealed from his wife Rachel who continued their lifestyle using credit cards. His secretive professional life fueled suspicions of espionage, while in reality, he struggled as an unemployed provider. Financial strain escalated with debts from failed ventures and the ill-advised rental of an expensive house. In a bid to recover, Neil launched a website offering get-rich-quick schemes, ironically contrasting his own dire financial state yet failing to attract customers. Amid mounting financial burdens, the family's extravagant living choices compounded their troubles. Certainly, financial troubles were one aspect, but the couple's love that led to this emigration was stronger than anything else to the point that Neil hid the difficulties he was experiencing from his wife. Simply put, on the emotional level, their feelings were also deteriorating for several months, with a form of distance seeming to have arisen between Neil and Rachel. The communication within the couple wasn't as smooth anymore, with the relationship shifting from passion to superficial exchanges, leading to progressively deteriorating sexual intimacy as well. The couple was ultimately affected at all levels. So, was it because of the birth of their daughter Lillian? 
the many months they had spent under Rachel's mother and stepfather's roof or simply the impact of their financial issues. Yes, Rachel wasn't completely naive. She suspected that the couple's finances weren't as healthy as her husband made them seem. When she questioned him about it, he brushed off the subject carefully avoiding providing any answers. Naturally, such an attitude had become irritating over time, leading to regular disputes and tensions that certainly played a role in the decline of this once promising relationship. On the other hand, the young man was dissatisfied with his sex life, and he also disliked the rough exchanges with his wife. Thus, he had decided to embark on a challenging path, that of infidelity. Initially, he had consumed a lot of adult films privately, but soon that wasn't enough to fulfill his needs. He had then signed up on an adult dating site catering to those seeking solely the satisfaction of sexual encounters. This was how Neil had spent hours crafting his profile on this website, eventually coming up with a description that suited him. Here is the description he wrote, I'm looking to meet American women of all ages. I need to confirm what my friends have told me, that you're much better in bed than the women living on the other side of the ocean. We both want the same thing, so there's no reason to linger here. Rachel, of course, knew nothing about her husband's selfish acts. He was particularly cautious when it came to protecting his secrets. Moreover, the couple had also not exposed their problems to external people. Rachel had kept to herself the decline in her understanding with her husband. Everyone in the family thought that the marriage was as solid as it was at the beginning when it had actually been hanging by a thread. To such an extent that on January 21, 2006, at 8.15 in the morning, Neil had flown to the United Kingdom to escape the toxic atmosphere prevailing in the household. He had joined his family seeking comfort, especially with the support of his parents. Rachel, on her part, had stayed at home with their daughter Lillian. On the same evening at 7 p.m., two friends, Johanna Gately and her sister Maureen, arrived at her house as planned, as they had arranged to have dinner together. Johanna and Maureen had found themselves in front of Rachel's house. They had talked briefly and then had headed together to the porch and the front door. They had knocked to announce their presence, but to their great surprise, there had been no response. They had tried again, but the same pattern had repeated. Curiously, why would Rachel have invited them over only to disregard them once they arrived? It was indeed peculiar, though not as baffling as the handwritten note discovered in front of the door. The note bore Rachel's mother's handwriting, inquiring about her absence from the previously scheduled family gathering earlier that day. Johanna had become worried for her friend, as her behavior was undeniably unusual, causing even her own mother to be concerned. These worries mirrored those of an anxious mother who had been unable to contact her daughter for several hours. The two women had hung up. Rachel's mother didn't waste any more time and requested the assistance of the police to conduct a check at her place, aiming to understand more. Officers were promptly dispatched after this call to carry out the verification. Upon arriving at the Entwistle family's home, it became apparent that the house showed no signs of forced entry and everything was in order on the outside. However, as they went around the property, they noticed that the garage wasn't locked, allowing access in inside the house, while the television in the living room, the radio in Lillian's bedroom, and a light in the couple's room were all on, there was no trace of their daughters. The agents were also searching for Neil because he hadn't informed any family members about his departure for the United Kingdom. In other words, at this stage, the authorities had no news from the entire family and couldn't contact Neil who was in England, as they believed he had also disappeared mysteriously. Nevertheless, there were no signs of break-ins or evidence of struggle or bloodshed. As a result, the officers didn't rule out the possibility that the family had left hastily and might return soon. Johanna wasn't convinced by this explanation, especially since she was invited by her friend for dinner a few hours earlier. Obviously, she had no authority to compel the police to stay, but she could. So, she parked her car near the house and waited for their return. The evening passed, then the night, and now it was the early morning of January 22nd. Still with no news from this entire group, 
Johanna explained to Rachel's parents that she had spent the night waiting in her car and observing any movement near the house without results. Therefore, they decided to report the disappearance to the Hopkinton Police Station. Around 6 p.m., police officers returned to the Entwistle's residence to conduct a more thorough search inside the house this time. The checks following the absence of news from a relative were usually superficial and simply confirmed that no danger was imminent. As they entered the garage for the second time, a slightly unpleasant odor, which wasn't present in the air the day before, became noticeable and it grew stronger as the law enforcement officers progressed through the house. The smell became increasingly nauseating as the agents advanced, to the point of making the air unbreathable on the landing of the floor. The officers separated to search the area, one headed toward the bathroom, while the other went toward the master bedroom. The first one entered the bathroom, finding nothing unusual. The second officer opened the door to the bedroom, observed for a moment before entering, and approached the bed to check for potential clues. As he gently moved the cover, a shock ran through him. He had just uncovered a human foot. He removed the bed linens and discovered two bodies, those of 27-year-old Rachel and Twistle and her barely nine-month-old daughter, Lillian. The bodies were hidden under sheets and a heavy comforter arranged in such a way that they were imperceptible at first glance. The large bed suggested a disorder, which explained why the first police officers hadn't noticed anything abnormal. It appeared that the massacre had occurred while the victims were asleep. The police immediately proposed this theory due to the position of the bodies. Rachel was positioned on her left side with her legs drawn inward and her arm rested on her child's chest cuddled against her. Both Rachel and Lillian were dressed in pajamas and it didn't seem that their bodies had moved. They were executed in their sleep in that bed. The scene was difficult to bear. Pillows had been placed over the faces of both victims. The young Lillian, with her big green eyes, had just been born making it an especially challenging moment for the investigators. But there was no choice, they had to investigate. The bodies bore easily observable wounds, with clothing partially obstructing the injuries. The police officers immediately understood what had caused the death of the mother and her daughter as they discovered bullet impacts on each of their chests. It was undeniably a tragedy and a double murder. However, there was urgency as only two members of the family had been found in the house. Where was Neil, the father? Had he also died? These were legitimate questions that the authorities were asking themselves, unaware that he was far away from home, overseas. It wasn't until the following day that the police obtained an answer regarding Neil, the father of the family. They discovered that he had left the country several days prior and contacted him to deliver the dreadful news. However, the man's reaction wasn't what was expected. He told the agent who explained his wife and daughter's death that he knew what had happened. Indeed, during that discussion, he revealed that on January 20, 2006, after leaving to go for a run around 9 o'clock in the morning, he found the lifeless bodies of Rachel and Lillian in the marital bed. When he returned two hours later, he didn't know yet who was responsible for this massacre. Hello? Hello? Hello. Hi, is this Neil? It is, yes. Neil, this is, uh, my name is Bob Manning. I'm a trooper with the Massachusetts State Police. Hi. How are you? Uh, well. I'm calling you because we have a bad, we had some bad news from over here. Yeah. And, um, I, um, uh, we have some bad news about your wife and your daughter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, gee, that, uh, we, uh, we responded to the house and that they're deceased. Yeah. Do you know that? I did. You did? Yeah. I walked in, I, I called out to them. There was no reply. I, I thought maybe they were, you know, I couldn't hear the shower work or maybe in the bathroom or something. So I, I didn't, I just um, got a few things together downstairs and that's when I found them. He continued by saying that following this terrible discovery, he simply placed the comforter over the bodies and the only thing he thought about was ending his own life. 
but a detail thwarted his plans because the only weapons he had at home were kitchen knives. The fear of a long and painful death made him lose the courage to take his own life by jumping from heights. So, he took his car to go to his father-in-law Joseph Matarazzo's house, hoping to get hold of the .22 caliber long rifle revolver Joseph owned, all to carry out what he wished to do at home but in a gentler way. Unfortunately, when Neil arrived at his destination, no one was there and the house door was locked. Unable to get the weapon he needed and completely panicked, he then decided to take the first plane to England the next morning to be with his family. Confused, he told the police officer that he didn't know why he didn't think to call for help at the time before insisting that his initial thoughts were solely focused on how to end his own life. When the police officer asked him if he had done anything unusual or regrettable that day, Neil immediately responded no. Of course not, he loved his wife and daughter more than anything, and this love was mutual. Why would he do such a thing? Moreover, he stated that he is still so shocked by what he experienced three days ago that he still hasn't managed to properly grieve their loss. Meanwhile, investigations continued on American soil because if it wasn't Neil, then who was it? The autopsy results unsurprisingly show that Rachel died from a close-range gunshot wound to her head and chest. Lillian, on the other hand, lost her life due to a close-range gunshot wound to her chest. The projectile that passed through the child also went through her mother's left breast. Moreover, the bullets were so small that those lodged in Rachel's head went unnoticed until the autopsy. In January, American police went to the UK to question Neil, a suspect in an investigation. Despite initially cooperating, Neil's behavior turned evasive, notably absent from the funeral of his wife and daughter, raising suspicions. The funeral on February 1st, 2006 gathered loved ones and sympathetic strangers. Neil's detached during the event contrasted with his earlier affectionate demeanor, intensifying investigators' concerns and leading to damning discoveries. Indeed, Neil's DNA was found on the .22 long rifle revolver handle owned by his stepfather, a weapon he denied accessing on January 20th. If his claim of prior use for sport shooting with Joseph Matarazzo holds true, complications arose as the gun has since been handled by others. Justifying Neil's DNA on it was complex, even more so since Rachel's DNA was found on the weapon's barrel. Furthermore, keys from Neil's in-law's home were discovered in his car, left at Boston Airport on the day of his abrupt departure to England countering his previous statement of being locked out on the incident day. This evidence exposed his deception. Multiple indications pointed at Neil. Even data on his seized computer didn't favor his innocence. On January 16, 2006, just days before the murders, the profile and conducted disturbing Google searches on how to kill with a knife and visited pages discussing killing and euthanasia. Subsequent searches included half-price escort, with visits to a dating site where Neil had a profile, the last being on January 20th, just after 11 o'clock, the time he claimed to find the victims. Likely, Neil's testimony didn't align with reality, extending to his actions upon arriving in England. Despite claiming urgency due to the shocking discovery, he only reached his parents' workshop 36 hours later, casting doubt on his alleged haste. After leaving the airport, he embarked on a journey covering nearly 13 kilometers, leaving behind uncertainty about his actions and destinations. On January 21st, around 11 p.m., an attempt to withdraw money and an overnight stay at a regional hotel marked his presence. Amid inconsistencies, coupled with compelling physical evidence including a potentially linked weapon, an arrest warrant was issued on February 8th. The subsequent day, February 9th, saw his apprehension by Metropolitan Police at the Royal Oak London Underground Station. The arrest revealed an incriminating blue bag containing a disturbing notebook outlining plans to capitalize on the tragic death of his wife and child in both the UK 
and the U.S. While professing love for his family in parts, the notebook also contained shockingly calculated letters aimed at potential publishers, portraying his unwavering pursuit of wealth. His arrest led to Middlesex County Prosecutor Martha Kochley disclosing investigators' findings during a press conference. Allegedly, on January 19th, Rachel was alive. But on the morning of January 20th, Niall and Twistle allegedly callously shot both his wife and their daughter Lillian using a .22 caliber rifle obtained from his father-in-law. While his initial intent to end his own life remained unconfirmed, it's derived solely from the suspect's statements. In a shocking turn of events, Neil and Twistle returned to the Matarazzo residence to replace the weapon before leaving the country as his departure was set for the following morning. He ultimately surrendered to extradition and departed for the United States on February 15th. He was facing severe charges, including the premeditated murder of Rachel and Lillian, illegal firearm possession, and ammunition possession. The trial commenced over two years later in a Waburn court, revealing a facade of a perfect family man concealing his debts and deception. Evidence exposed his affair with Rachel and his emotionless demeanor throughout the trial, breaking only at the sight of his daughter's blood-stained garment. His defense attempted to shift the blame, painting Rachel as the perpetrator, but the jury saw through it. They declared Neil and Twistle guilty on all counts after a 13-hour deliberation on June 25, 2008. The next day, he received a life sentence in prison with no chance of parole. Neil and Twistle appealed his conviction before the Massachusetts Supreme Court, claiming illegal searches and seizure of evidence. His appeal was denied in August 2012, and the U.S. Supreme Court rejected the case in January 2013. With no legal options left, he faced life in prison. Given his infamous nickname as the Baby Killer, he became a target for fellow inmates, leading to his isolation and multiple transfers to safer facilities due to serious threats. Thank you for listening and don't forget to follow for more crime stories.